Versailles, in the late 1700s, is an oasis of extravagance, surrounded by a land in despair. And with an uncertain king at the helm, France is charting a course for disaster. After 19 years of marriage, Louis has sired four children. Yet as a king, he remains impotent. As the financial crisis escalates, all the king can do is hire and fire a succession of ministers, none of whom have the answers. By ancient privilege, the nobility and clergy are exempt from taxation. And so as taxes rise to cover the government's mounting debt repayments, the burden falls heavily upon the poorest. To add to their misery, freakish weather arrives to decimate the harvest. If ever God intervened to make a situation worse, the summer of 1788 and the spring of 1789 is a moment when that happens. By the summer of 1788, you already have a burgeoning political crisis, and it's developing against a background of very serious food shortage. For the people of France in 1788, bread is the essence of life itself. Most ordinary people in France ate at least two pounds a day of bread. Bread was all important. Its price was immediately felt by everyone. If the price doubled, you were in big trouble. Under the financial mismanagement of Louis's government, the cost of bread skyrockets. Food supplies are hoarded by profiteers, and the cost of a loaf of bread can equal a month's wages. Hunger turns to rage. Bread riots break out across France. Bakeries are raided, and shopkeepers suspected of hoarding bread are lynched on the spot. With the economy in shambles, Louis is forced to appoint Jacques Necker as his finance minister. An enlightened thinker, Necker is popular with the people in a way that Louis can only envy. Jacques Necker was undoubtedly the most popular minister throughout the spring of 89 because he's taken the line publicly in his writings that the government's duty is to make sure that there is enough bread and grain for everybody. Necker urges Louis to call a meeting of the traditional representative body of the kingdom, the Estates General. It will be the first time the Estates General has convened in 175 years. France was politically organized in something called the Estates. The first estate was the clergy, the second estate was the nobility, and the third estate was everyone else, and by a contemporary Reckoning the first two estates uh, occupied 3% of the population and the third estate 97% of the population. A lot of people felt it was very unfair for this third estate, which was most of the population, to only have one-third of the deputies. They felt it was very unfair that this should be a three-chamber parliament where two chambers, the nobility and the clergy, could always outvote the commoners. The 4th of May, 1789. A skilled young lawyer and politician arrives at Versailles. Maximilien Robespierre comes to stand before the Estates General as a deputy to fight for a fair voice for the people he represents, the Third Estate. An orphan from the provinces, Robespierre had risen to academic prominence on a prestigious scholarship, becoming an eloquent speaker, prim in appearance, with never a hair nor a phrase out of place. Returning home to the town of Arras, the Enlightenment ideas he had absorbed as a student drove him to become a powerful advocate for the downtrodden. By the time he went back and started to practice as a lawyer, he was reading very widely in the Enlightenment. And Robespierre was someone who, when he was practicing law in Arras, tried to actually bring the ideas of the Enlightenment into the cases he was fighting. In the Estates General, Robespierre and his colleagues are determined to make the nobility and clergy pay taxes. Louis feels threatened by the growing radicalism of the Third Estate. After a six-week standoff, the deputies arrive to find that they have been locked out. 
On June 20th, when the deputies come to their meeting and find the doors locked, they suspect a plot. They move next door to what we call a tennis court, which was really a handball court, and gather together and swear they will not stop meeting until they have a new constitution. The deputies have declared themselves to be the National Assembly, the true representatives of the people of France. The tennis court oath is one of these great symbolic moments in the history of the French Revolution. You had these people assembled in this great open space of the tennis court, raising their arms in this sort of quasi-Roman salute. And for the National Assembly, this was a moment when they realized something of their power and their dignity and saw that they really could defy France's king. In one revolutionary stand of defiance, the National Assembly is born. It will be a parliamentary body enacting the people's will and addressing their grievances. But grabbing power from the king would not be so easy as signing a simple proclamation. All of these early victories that take place at Versailles are largely paper victories and they have no teeth to back them up. And the fear that it happens uh, takes over the deputies at Versailles as we approach July, mid-July is that the king is gathering his forces to disperse them, to overthrow them. By July, 30,000 royal troops are taking position around Paris. To defend themselves, the people form a national guard. Les Invalides, the military hospital, is raided, and 28,000 muskets distributed. The only thing missing is gunpowder, but the people know just where to get it. Near the center of Paris, there looms a massive stone keep, an infamous symbol of tyrannical government, the Bastille. The prison houses the city's stores of gunpowder and is legendary as a place where enemies of the crown disappeared. The Bastille had been the great symbol of royal despotism, the great symbol of the kings of France running beyond the just limits of their own power, a symbol of horror for the people of France. Amidst the rioting, news spreads that Louis has sacked his finance minister, the people's beloved Jacques Necker. The court holds him responsible for the revolt of the third estate. To the people of Paris, it appears their enemies at court are striking back. On the 14th of July, crowds band together, identifying themselves with a rosette, red and blue for the colors of Paris, separated by white, the color of the House of Bourbon. The tricolor is born. From the feverish crowd, a voice cries out, to the Bastille. Attacking the Bastille means that the people of Paris are saying, you cannot get rid of the new National Assembly. The people are acting, they're arming themselves, and they're basically saying, we take the side of the revolution. The governor of the Bastille, the Marquis de Lone, tries to secure the prison when he learns of the approaching mob. He mounts a hopeless defense with only 32 guards. The marauders storm the fortress and tear into the soldiers with knives and pikes. Finally, Governor de Lone surrenders, but the enraged mob engulfs him, dragging him into the streets. The jeering horde kicks and stabs at him until his pleas for death are answered. Before the end of the day, the mayor of Paris will meet a similar fate. A revolutionary tradition is born. Delaunay's severed head is paraded on a pike to the delight of the crowd. Word of the bloody revolt quickly reaches the deputies at the National Assembly. Well, the deputies in the National Assembly do not immediately condemn this act of violence. In fact, they accept it. And it was this acceptance of uh, popular violence that, in some people's view, uh, created a pattern that was to have catastrophic consequences for uh, the unfolding of the revolution. With the smoke still clearing over the Bastille, Louis XVI returns from a hunting trip. In his diary, under the date 14th of July, 1789, he writes, Nothing, a reference to his unsuccessful hunt. Then an aide brings news of the fall of the Bastille. 
Is it a revolt? asks the king. No, sire, he is answered. It is a revolution. The victory at the Bastille marks a crucial moment in French history. The people had defied their king and won. There would be no turning back. As a symbol of the defeat of oppression, the people dig with their bare hands and tear apart the Bastille brick by brick. They are beginning to dismantle the past itself. The French went about the process of tearing down the Bastille as quickly as they could. In the absence of powerful explosives, this was done very painstakingly, but with a tremendous amount of vigor. And the bricks were given away, sold as emblems of the demolition of despotism. The energy of the streets invigorates the National Assembly. A revolutionary manifesto is adopted called the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. It calls for an end to tyranny and for a representative government to protect the freedom and equality of all men. The Declaration of the Rights of Man was a declaration promulgated by the National Assembly which said in its text that the sovereignty belongs to the people, belongs to the nation. The king is nowhere mentioned in this document. Therefore, by issuing this document, the Assembly was effectively seizing power for itself. With the new National Assembly as their voice, the people of France set out to change the very fabric of their world. They demand a constitutional monarchy, equal rights for all men, and justice under reasonable laws. Robespierre demands increased freedom for the press, which had been muzzled under the old regime. The resulting free press is spearheaded by L'Ami du Peuple, the people's friend. A fiery newspaper full of vitriolic rants and provocation, it is the brainchild of a former doctor, Jean-Paul Marat. A controversial author of tracts on science and philosophy, Marat was rejected by France's Académie des Sciences. It left an enduring bitterness against the French establishment. Later, whilst on the run from royalist police, Marat contracted a painful skin disease that left him confined for long periods to a medicinal bath. Marat finds in the revolution the perfect outlet for his venom. Jean-Paul Marat was just one of these professional malcontents. And unfortunately, revolutions do offer opportunity to professional malcontents. Marat took all of that bile, all of that resentment, and funneled it into a newspaper that became extraordinarily successful, L'Ami du Peuple. Marat was a man possessed of extraordinary anger. You just have to read the pages of his newspaper, The Friend of the People, to see this. In every issue, he displays a complete paranoid mentality. He sees plots everywhere. Everybody is plotting against the revolution. And the answer is very simple for him. The answer is blood. The answer is heads. Marat loathes the monarchy's extravagance amidst the poverty gripping France and needs only the slightest rumor to lambast the king and queen in his newspaper. On the 2nd of October, 1789, his anger boils over. Word reaches Paris that the king has thrown a party at Versailles, that the king's soldiers threw the new tricolor flag, symbol of the revolution, to the ground and trampled it underfoot. Marat is enraged. He reports the insult in his paper, just as a new threat breaks. The king has again ordered troops to move into position around Paris. With victory at the Bastille still fresh in their minds, Marat frantically urges the people of Paris to take action again. It's time to open your eyes, he tells them. Shake yourselves out of your torpor. Wake up. Once more, wake up. The 5th of October. Dawn breaks to the furious ringing of bells. Women gather to protest against the shortage of bread. And now fear of the approaching troops mixes with fury at the news of the king's offensive party. Soon thousands are marching to Versailles, pikes in hand. The women are taking their grievances to the king. 
the core of the crowd was made up of the famous poissardes, the fearsome fish ladies of the central markets who were known for their brawny build and their fearlessness. They were equipped with large knives for scaling fish. They were hugely muscular because they carted boxes. Uh, you didn't want to tangle with these ladies. These are women of the poor quarters. These are poor women which are affected by the increased price of bread, by the scarcity of products, who suddenly begin to realize that they must act. It is quite extraordinary how these ordinary women, probably most of them couldn't even write their name, suddenly act as the protagonists of the historical process. At the palace, word of the approaching crowd of angry women reaches the Queen's chambers. Legend has it, that it is at this moment that Marie Antoinette utters the most famous line she never said. Marie Antoinette did not say, let them eat cake. That is a myth. Marie Antoinette, unfortunately, probably never even noticed the poor people of her country long enough to make such a statement. As the mob of women gather outside the gates, Louis understands the revolution can no longer be ignored. It is being brought to his front door. He agrees to sign the Declaration of the Rights of Man, but the crowd continues to grow throughout the night. By morning, 20,000 people are camped outside the palace. To close the centuries of distance between the king and his subjects, the angry mass demands that the king and queen move to Paris. Typically, Louis prevaricates. His hesitation would provoke a fury in the crowd and put the lives of the royal family in grave danger. When they don't get instant compliance with what they want, it really looks as if they're going to uh, massacre the Queen. The mob break into the palace, screaming for the blood of the Queen. They massacre guards, decapitate them, and stick their heads on pikes. They were like banshees screaming throughout the palace, give me her entrails, give me her head, I want a leg, I want an arm. I think that they had grown so frenzied that if they had encountered her, they probably would have torn her to pieces. Terrified for her life, Marie Antoinette escapes to Louis' apartments, only moments before the women break into her chambers and tear her bed to shreds. The king and queen are now trapped by the mob and at its mercy. The only way the women can be pacified is for the royal family to agree to go to Paris. Because once they're there in Paris, then they can ultimately be made to do what the people of Paris want. They march 60,000 strong leaving Versailles with carts and wagons filled with flour from the royal storehouses. The king and the queen were forced to go to Paris with the heads of their guards who had been massacred in the chateau. Their heads had been cut off with knives. This was a moment of completely unbridled violence. These heads were made up with makeup and paraded in front of the carriage with the king and queen following. The king and queen are installed in the Tuileries Palace. They will never see Versailles again. Once the royal family moves to Paris, they are the prisoners of Paris. They know it, everybody else knows it. There are great limits to what they can do or even dream of doing. They are the prisoners of the capital city, there's no doubt. Versailles is abandoned and the assembly moves to Paris. Ultimate power now seems to rest with the Paris mob. France will have a new democracy, new laws, and a new terrifying symbol of the revolution will make its first appearance. The guillotine. <laughs> 